without further ado, I know I've talked really, really fast, <laughs> but I want to get to Kevin Tedeschi <laughs> and um, formally indu- introduce him. And guys, this is we're, we've got some great things to talk about. So share the show. Hang on. If you have questions, call in. Um, Don, you, would you like to introduce Absolutely. him? Absolutely. Well, let's let's uh, put him live if you don't mind. Um, uh, Wahid, if we can go ahead and get yes. Kevin's mic on. Yeah. Yes, good. Uh, join me, everyone, in welcoming Kevin Tedeschi, the CEO and Executive Director of the Edgar Casey Association of Research and Enlightenment. Welcome, Kevin. Um, Thanks for having me on the program. Yeah. So you have been a part of the program for over 35 years. You've lectured all over the world and authored over 25 books on amazing subjects. So tell us, who is Edgar Casey for our listeners who don't already know? Well, Edgar Casey is the most documented psychic of all time. Uh, he lived between 1877 and 1945. For 43 years of his adult life, he was able to put himself to sleep on a couch. We, we still have the couch here in our visitor center. Close his eyes. His wife would give him the name and address of anyone anywhere in the country. He could tune into that person, uh, outline. Most often, his readings were about health. He would outline what was wrong with them, how they could get well. Uh, sometimes he'd even recommend doctors, of which he had no conscious knowledge for them to go to. And uh, he gave readings really for people to improve their livelihood, their well-being, their physical health. And then uh, along about 1923, someone started asking different kinds of questions about uh, past lives, astrology, business advice, you name it. And so the Edgar Casey database contains approximately 10,000 different topics, uh, 24 million words, anything imaginable that people like you and I would have asked Mr. Casey when he was alive uh, between uh, until 1945 is really in the database. And our job here is to really disseminate that information uh, to individuals. One of the mottos we use here is we create uh, programs and activities of profound personal change, and we're really here to help people improve their lives physically, mentally, and spiritually. Uh, one of the reasons we're here in Virginia Beach is that uh, Edgar Casey was accurate when he was giving readings in terms of what was wrong with a person, but for whatever reason, they'd get a reading from Edgar Casey, they'd go to their doctor, and they'd say, you know, this man I never met who lives a thousand miles away, I'll put himself to sleep on a couch, tuned into my illness, and here's what we're supposed to do about it. And some of the things Casey was recommending were different than the medicine of the day. He was recommending a change in diet, uh, importance of attitudes and emotions that uh, uh, he drew from every school of medicine, from surgery to holism. And uh, for whatever reason, doctors were hesitant to carry out some of those treatments. And so his dream was to have a hospital uh, where people would come and regular doctors would carry out the treatments and he would give readings. And that's really why we uh, came to Virginia Beach in 1925 and the hospital was built and we actually renovated the hospital about four years ago and today it's our spa and our restaurant where people come from all over for uh, a treatment of some kind and then they usually stay and get something to eat. Do you have um, readers on site now that continue to do his work like medical mediumship? That I know that that's one of the terms a lot of people use for that. Um, wow. is, is there people there that still currently do medical readings there? We actually work with psychics in lots of different ways. Uh, if you're here in Virginia Beach, once a month we have a, uh, a psychic fair where people come mm-hmm. and they can actually people line up around the building, yes. several hundred to come in for uh, our psychic fairs. We also do programs here on intuition, how to improve your intuition, uh, how to learn how to get psychic information from within yourself. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then for people who don't live in Virginia Beach, we actually do programs on intuition and psychic ability throughout the country. And then we have a list of people who have been on our programs that people could get readings from if they want to just call our 800 number. So we we try to help people get in touch with their own intuition, and we help people get answers to the questions that they need help with. And you know, Beth, we had John Holland on recently, yes. and he was a, a guest um, yes. at ARE. So Absolutely. Yeah. John John is here very often. In fact, John and I have done programs together. He's a great guy, uh, really supportive of this work, and does an amazing work himself. He does. He does. We loved having him as a guest, and I think I have six of his books. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, he's definitely, I call him a mentor. When I was um, when I was training and going through psychic development myself, like psychic development myself, I used to tune into Hay House Radio like every night. But I would also make sure I like, I listened to his program among, you know, Dr. Wayne Dyers and Esther Hicks and, you know, all those to just kind of help get my brain in that frequency and get trained, um, you know, on a daily basis before I went to bed. And John Holland was one of my mentors that I would listen to. You also teach um, yourself. You teach how to get um, tune into your own intuition and how you can use that yourself, correct? 
I do. I mean, the Casey readings suggest that each of us is wired for a guidance and intuition. And one of the quotes he said was that you, you can actually get guidance for everything from digging for fishing worms to writing a concerto. And um, uh, I, I have gone actually through every high school in Virginia Beach and shown people how they can get access to their own intuition. Uh, whether it's in dreams or intuitive hunches or synchronicity or whatever it might be. And usually, for example, when I'm in a high school, maybe 30 kids, at the end of the class, I'll say, how many people think they got an answer to their question? And every hand goes up. Yes. So, you know, it, it, it's amazing how uh, easy it is to get intuitive help. And it's amazing how few of us actually try it. It's well, uh, Kevin, help totally us agree. out today. How do you do that? <laughs> yeah, what's well, your best kept <laughs> secret? What's your number one secret to tuning into if, your own intuition? We're in that high school classroom, you know, take us through it for our listeners today. Okay, well, I, well, I would recommend it for like for two people. And actually, this is something my wife and I do a lot. Uh, each of you get let's, a piece of paper or an index card. So both a piece of paper look, look alike. And on one side of your index card, write out a question you'd like to have an answer to. And your partner or your wife or your friend can do the same thing. And then turn those pieces of paper upside down is one way to do it. Or actually, you can fold your piece of paper and give it to the other person. And then what you want to do is one of the challenges with our intuition is our conscious mind, our fears, our yes. wants, our desires often gets in the way of the intuition. So what you do is you, you actually set that aside and I usually have people hold on to a piece of paper and then think of something else like imagine themselves in a place or imagine meeting a person, or imagine going to a movie, or imagine opening a package and what's inside. And it really doesn't even matter what you imagine, just imagine something besides the question. Right. And if, if both people are imagining, let's say, uh, being in a place, or meeting a person, or opening a package, you just take yourself through that. What does that package look like? What is that person doing? What are they saying? Or how do you feel about that place? And write down everything you uh, are experiencing about that place while you're holding that question. And then when you're done, and your partner's done, look at what you've seen, and then describe how you fe felt about what you saw, and your partner can do the same thing. And your feelings, your descriptions will have insights to the an to the question that's on your piece of paper. Wow. It works every time. Wow. That's how amazing. Interesting. Yes. I just want to make sure I got the detail right, though. Yeah. Okay. Um, does your partner see the question ahead of time? You, well, you both. Let, let me or tell do you, they you just real, feel it in their hand? Well, you, let, let me walk you through a real life example. How's that? Okay, yeah, so that sounds great. On, on one occasion, I was with a partner, and she had written down the question. Uh, uh, should I leave my job? And I did not see the question because uh, okay. the question is a secret. You don't see the question. Instead, okay, you focus on the images. So the images I focused on, I, I imagined a place. And the place I saw was Quito, Ecuador. And there is actually an Edgar Casey Center in Quito. Uh -huh. uh, we have Edgar Casey Centers in 30 countries. And so I told the woman, well, Quito is where they measured the equator. And when you're there, you can actually stand with one foot in the North Hemisphere and one foot in the South Hemisphere. And the woman said, well, you know, I, I really have my feet in two different worlds because I keep thinking I should leave my job, I should stay. I should leave my job, I should stay. And it's driving me crazy. And in the process of the thinking of the question, I wanted to think of somebody uh, I really admire. So the person I thought of at the time was Walt Disney. So I told the woman, I said, well, for me, Walt Disney is a, is a symbol of creativity and imagination. And she said, you know, that's really why I want to leave my job. There's no creativity and imagination. It's like being a, in a, a cog in a wheel or being on an assembly line. And it's the same thing over and over and over again. And Walt showed me his watch, uh, which, of course, is a symbol for time. So the woman had written out the question, should I leave my job? And the answer really was, it was time. Wow. And, and after talking about it for a minute, we started realizing, you know, Quito, how do you spell Quito? Q-U-I-T. So uh, it, it, the answer was in, was in the symbolism. That's great. And, <laughs> and that process actually works for everyone. I play with my son. I play with yes. my wife. We play here at, at ARE for the staff. It, it's, a great, it's a great game. I can't okay. wait to try that experiment uh, yes. at home with my We're husband. We're all going to know That's what we'll great. be doing later. So we got to go to a commercial break, Kevin. But we're listeners, if you didn't hear that experiment, tune in. And next thing I want to ask you is why people refer to Edgar Casey as a prophet. So we'll be right back on Psychic Soup with Kevin Tedeschi. You guys don't want to miss it. We'll tune, tune in, hang on, and share it. Be right back.
executive director of the Edgar Cayce ARE Institute, um, and that is the, what is it Association called Association of Research and Enlightenment. Yes. yes. <laughs> you guys would, It just rolls off the tongue. <laughs> it does. It rolls off the tongue. So my next question to you, thank you for sharing that experiment. I can't wait to try it, and if you guys didn't hear it, you're going to want to go in the archives and listen to it because it's pretty dynamite. It's about tuning into your own intuition. Um, Edgar Cayce, a lot of people um, have referred to him as a prophet. Why, why would you say that? Who was he? How did he come into his own gifts? And why did he, I don't know if he referred himself as a prophet, but I know other people do. Why, why is that? Let, let me give you a little more background information. Uh, he, he didn't start out to want to be a psychic, actually. He started out uh, selling uh, basically insurance. He was a traveling salesman. And uh, he had had a number of psychic experiences growing up. For example, when he was uh, just in about fifth or sixth grade, he fell asleep on his spelling book. Uh, and his father got very frustrated with him because he was supposed to be learning the lesson. And when his father woke him up, Casey asked him to call out a page in the book. And his father could call out a page. And somehow Casey had retained a photographic uh, picture of everything on that page. So clairvoyantly, he was able to sleep on a book and memorize its contents. Uh, he used that gift actually to get a job at a bookstore later on. He went to apply to work at the, work at the bookstore. And they said they didn't need anybody. And he asked if he could uh, have a copy of their inventory. And he took it home and slept on it and came back and knew the inventory better than anyone there. So other than that, and the ability to see people he said who were deceased, uh, he was a normal guy in every respect. And then in the uh, turn of the century, he was selling insurance. He was really excited about saving money and getting married to his fiancee, Gertrude. And one day he woke up with laryngitis. And most of us wouldn't be worried if we had laryngitis. It usually goes in a day or so. But this persisted. And he went to see doctors. And the days turned into weeks. And the weeks turned into months. And pretty soon, if you're a salesman with laryngitis, you're out of a job. And so he became a photographer because it didn't require a whole lot of speaking. And we actually have many of his pictures here in our archives. And uh, then about a, a year later, he was uh, at a stage show. They had a traveling hypnotist come to town. And they were asking for volunteers. And apparently one of his friends volunteered him out in the audience. And he went up on stage. And he, he told himself he'd put himself to sleep like he did when he went to sleep on his school books. And when that happened, the hypno hypnotist asked him a question in case he spoke back normally which everyone was amazed because they knew he had laryngitis. So when he woke up, however, he still had laryngitis. So later on, another friend put him under uh, hypnosis and had, a doctor nearby had an idea. He said, well, why don't we ask Casey to describe what's wrong with him and how he can get well? And so under hypnosis, he described it was a psychological condition producing a physical effect and it gave a, an approach to heal the problem. And they followed it in case he was cured. And the laryngitis, the laryngitis had lasted almost a year. Wow. And Casey was very happy to be cured. The doctor had other ideas. And he wondered, you know, if Casey can do this for himself, can he do it for other people? Mm -hmm. And so he started bringing some of his hardest ca hearted cases to Casey. Uh, eventually, he wrote a, the doctor wrote a paper that was picked up by the New York Times. And the headline read, uh, Illiterate Man Becomes Doctor When Hypnotized. Mm -hmm. uh, he wasn't illiterate, but it made for a better headline. Right, exactly. And from that time on, people who had basically given up hope would come to Mr. Casey for help with their health. And it was really mostly about health. Mm -hmm. But in the process of giving readings, Casey would lots of times say things as an aside, like uh, a woman who was having problems. Casey described how eventually doctors would be able to take a drop of blood and diagnose any illness. Well, in the 1920s, that was science fiction. Wow. Uh, he talked about uh, when people ask about uh, the ancient Jews, and he started giving readings on a sect called the Essenes. Uh, the word Essenes is not in the Bible, and the Essenes were only known to a very small uh, scholarly community. But Casey talked about how there were men and women in the community, that they had kept records of their activities, they were there at the Dead Sea. Uh, Casey died in 1945, and in 1948, they found the Dead Sea Scrolls. Wow, and yes. And a, a few years later, they uncovered women's bones in the cemetery. So there were men and women in the cemetery. Uh, he said on three occasions when he was giving a reading to someone, that uh, different people, that over history, the Nile had changed its course, and at one period in time, had actually flowed westward and entered into the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, that was science, science fiction. But then when the Skylab Imaging Telescope in the 1970s was taking pictures of the continental land masses, they discovered that the Nile had in fact changed its course and at one point had flowed westward into the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, Casey gave a number of prophecies for the future in terms of uh, where we're all headed as a collective humanity. And in 1967, when Jess Stern wrote the book, uh, 
uh, about Edgar Casey. He called it the sleeping prophet because yeah. somehow able, Casey was able to tune into futures that hadn't re- yet happened. Mm-hmm. Very often it was for individuals, Casey would talk about what they'd be like later on, and, and many of that, many of those things came to be true. That's why he's called the sleeping prophet. He's also been called uh, the father of holistic mer- medicine and yes. the miracle man of Virginia Beach. It's amazing. Um, toward the end of the show, you guys want to hang on. Um, you're going to yes. give us a couple of things that he sees for our future that that um, is written and, and you know about. I know you can't talk to him now. You're not a medium, but uh, definitely you've got some documentation that we want to share. So you guys tune in. Um, what I found interesting uh, was the book you wrote on the Akashic Records. And it was um, in what I what I would like to ask you is what were the Akashic records to Edgar Casey, and then we'll discuss later about your book. But what is that, and is that where he gets his information? Is that the is that the information he's channeling? Yes, he, when he was asked on a number of occasions, where do you get your information from? He said it was from the Akashic records. Well, the word Akashic comes from a Sanskrit word Akasha, which really means boundless space. And Casey suggested there was this uh, etheric force field, uh, an energy system around the earth, and that everything an individual ever did, every thought, every word, every deed, was recorded in these Akashic records next to the soul name. Mm. Uh, the Bible calls it God's book of remembrance or the book of life. As unusual as that may sound, probably many of your listeners have heard of a near-death experience where someone dies, and in that process they have a life review. They see their life before them, and then they're revived. Casey would say what's happening is the person is tuning into their own Akashic record. They're they're seeing what everything they've done in their life. And that's where Edgar Casey got his information. And the the, the Casey readings suggest that not only is there a record of the past, which is basically a compilation of everything a soul ever did. Right. But there's records related to the present. And based on any choices we make here in the present, we, we draw to ourselves different experiences. So that two people can have the very same experience. Let's say both people lose their job. Mm-hmm. And one person becomes bitter and angry. And the other person says, wow, I, I hated that job anyway. Now I can do something <laughs> I really like. So, so our life is not really created by the things that happen to us. Right. But how we choose to respond to the things that happen to us. And so the Akashic Records of the present really bring to us opportunities and experiences to help us co-create the life that we lead. And then the Akashic Records of the future are constantly calculating probabilities. If, if Kevin does this, here's the outcome. If Kevin does that, here's the outcome. That's what I was going to ask you. Can he, So he could actually tune into those probabilities in the future, correct? Because I know a lot of psychics, even myself, have a hard time giving futuristic readings just because there's so many variables and everybody has free will. It's a domino effect. So right. it's sometimes it's very difficult to see what's going to be ahead for someone's future because of those variables. How does the Akashic Records answer to that? What was Casey's answer to well, that? Well, uh, like you say, I mean, the, fur- the further something is out, sometimes the harder it is to do. And, and if a person hasn't yet made a choice, it's it's hard to do. But uh, as unusual as what I'm going to say sounds, each and every one of us at all times is actually tuning into our future. It's not just Edgar Casey. Okay. And we often have this experience where we're driving somewhere and we think, wait a minute, I've already driven here. Or we're having a conversation. We think, mm-hmm. wait Absolutely. a minute, I've already had this conversation. And we have an experience we call deja, deja vu. vu. Yeah, deja vu. Uh, Edgar Casey would say that very often when we sleep, our higher mind, our superconscious mind, is tuning into these probable realities. And we wake up the next day and we're having an experience. And we say, wait a minute, this has already happened. And it's because we're having fragmentary dream recall. So we actually tune in to our futures in the dream state. But unfortunately, most of us are not predisposed to work with our dreams. And so they, they just kind of elude us. So th- working with your dreams, um, I just st- looking up on your work, you, you mentioned how so important that is um, to work with your dreams. Is, is that something, you know, a lot of people think that's just their psychedelic uh, subconscious mind, but you actually, or in, and Edgar Casey actually felt that that was um, messages for you through the night. Is that correct? Correct. A- absolutely. That, uh, you know, one of the reasons... Uh, that dreams can be so helpful is that uh, science has proven, this is not Edgar Casey. this is science. Science has proven that more than 95% of the data and stimulus coming to you throughout the day is ignored because otherwise we'd be on overload. Mm-hmm. So for example, you don't feel the chair on the bottom of your seat or you, your feet on the floor or your clothes on your body or your glasses on your nose or you don't hear the heat and air conditioning systems. And even throughout the day, lots of things going on, you kind of ignore them. Right. Because otherwise we'd be on overload. Mm-hmm. But they're not gone. They're actually set aside in the subconscious so that 
That's why, for example, if you're at a crime scene and you're hypnotized, you remember more under hypnosis than you're aware of consciously. Yeah. So all of that, all that data comes to the forefront when we dream. And the Casey readings are really uh, uh, a big champion of actually writing out a question and dreaming on it and see what happens. And I have, I have dozens of stories of having oh, tried that and how it works, and it's just an amazing experience. So when you ask a question, like if you were writing down a question, you're not asking Edgar Casey. you're asking your higher self, self. is you're that asking correct? Your own higher, you're asking your own higher self, and from the dream you can get insights into any question imaginable. Have you had personal experience with that? Dozens, you want me to tell you one? Yes, or two? yes, 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 I would love okay. to. Give us some relatable uh, stories yeah. here. I'll, I'll tell you the first time it ever happened, which blew me away, and that, this has remained in my mind uh, like the day it happened. Uh, when I first got involved in ARE, we have uh, study groups all over the world. These are ecumenical groups that learn how to meditate, work with prayer, work with the KC information on soul growth. And, and I was the youngest person in my group. Everyone in the group was 20 or 30 years older, and so I always felt like I was catching up and I didn't want to look stupid or anything because I, I was you know, not quite 20. And every six months, one of the things this group did was they would decide on a question as a group. Everyone's going to ask the same question. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to go on, dream on it, and come back the next week at the end and share our experience. And I was really worried because I didn't remember my dreams. And I mm -hmm. thought, like, you know, there's 14 people in this group. I'm going to be the only one without a dream. I'm going to look really dumb. <laughs> but the, the question we decided was, uh, uh, what do I need to work on spiritually? And mm -hmm. what you did is you write out that question and you look at it before you go to bed and dream on it and see what happens. Well, the first night I didn't remember anything and so the next day I was really worried. So that next day what I did was I read it over and over and over again and then I folded up and I tucked it in my undershort so it would be with me all night. <laughs> this, this, is, this is the dream I had. Uh, I dreamed that I was coming out of the Great Pyramid. Now at that time I had never been to Egypt. Mm -hmm. uh, but I have been there six, six times since then. ARE leads tours all over the world, and Egypt is one of our most popular travel locations. But in the dream, I had, I had not yet been there, but in the dream, I'm in Egypt, and I'm coming out of the Great Pyramid, and apparently I'm on an ARE tour, and uh, uh, there's about 50 people there. And just as I step outside the pyramid, somebody in the crowd yells out, uh, by the way, Jesus taught Kevin some dance steps, and Kevin wants to show them to you now. <laughs> and I was really surprised because I didn't remember ever meeting Jesus, and I knew nothing yeah. about dancing. But all these people start gathering around me, and uh, somebody who I really didn't care for sat down in front of me. And I said something worse than this, but I'll clean it up for the radio. The person sat down, and I said, thought to myself, what an idiot, as this person sat down. <laughs> this is in your dream. What an idiot. In my dream. Yeah, what an idiot, this person sat down. And yes. it was worse than that, but that was the idea. Right. And I, I look out over the plateau, and there's Jesus standing there. And wow. he thought back what I had just wow. thought. And the next thought was, more than anything, you need to work on your thoughts. Wow. So I woke up. I had written out the question, what do I need to, to work on spiritually? And from the big guy himself, I get, get work on your thoughts. I was blown away. Yeah. And I have, I have asked questions a hundred times and gotten real valid insights for even practical things uh, that have been very helpful in life. What That's amazing. Story. Well, we're going to go to commercial break one more time, but you mentioned Egypt, and when we get back, I want to know why Egypt is so important to the Edgar Casey Foundation and uh, what Edgar Casey had to say about Egypt in past lives. I, I know you've got a great story about that and what that means to us. So we're here on Psychic Soup with Kevin Tedeschi. He works uh, CEO, Executive Director of Edgar Casey ARE Institute. We'll be right back. You guys tune in. You don't want to miss this. See you in a minute. Question I had was Egypt. Could you tell us um, why Egypt is, was, is so important to the Edgar Casey Foundation and what is the work that's being done? What does it mean? All that, the symbol, symbolism, everything. We could spend a whole day on this. Yes. So I'll just give you a brief overview. Yes. Uh, Casey gave about 1,900 uh, past life readings, and in a thousand of those past life readings, he mentions ancient Egypt. And in addition to that, he talks about the connection between Egypt and Atlantis. And so, in brief, Casey suggested that there was this continent of Atlantis, that uh, it had three destructions one about 50,000 BC, one about 28,000 BC, and one about 10,000 BC. And during the one about 10,000 BC, the Atlanteans knew that they were about to go under once and for all. So a group of them went to Egypt and worked with the Egyptians there and actually buried, according to Edgar Casey, buried records of their civilization near the paw of the Sphinx. Wow. In addition to that, they, according to Casey, they buried uh, ev evidence of their civilization in the Yucatan 
and they buried evidence of their civilization in the uppermost reaches of Bimini, what is now Bimini, which was a mountain point in Atlantis. And so Casey suggested that the time would come when the records, at least in Egypt, would be discovered and that we would understand it as a human family that we have been on this planet much longer than we now suppose, that at different periods in our history we had possessed incredible technological advances and that uh, we would understand that uh, really stronger, more strongly, our connection to the divine. Well, ever since that time, ARE has sponsored uh, research in Egypt We've sponsored research in uh, Bimini. We've sponsored research in, in the Yucatan. It's not generally known, but ARE actually helped underwrite the doctoral programs for people like Zahi Hawass, who was oh, head of the. I've heard uh, him speak. He's uh, yeah, spoken Yeah, he was in Atlanta. charge of the Giza. Yeah. Yep, he was in charge of the Giza plateau for a long time. Mark Lehner, who's been in charge of the Sphinx. Uh, that there is there's something about Egypt, the Casey would say, that will really help us recognize why we're here and what we're supposed to be doing as a human family. Is, uh, every, is that every, yet every, to be revealed? Is it, that something yet, that's pending? It's something yet to be revealed. That that Casey said that it would be found when we're ready to accept what Mm -hmm. We need to know about ourselves. Mm -hmm. Every October, we actually do an ancient mysteries conference here where we give an update on some of the uh, research that we've done. And, and the interesting thing is our ancient mysteries conference is probably our most popular event every year. We bring people from all over the world. We probably get close to 275 people here for a big event like that. And it's, it's just an ongoing topic that is important in the readings, uh, lots of information on ancient Egypt, at, at how it's connected to Atlantis, and what we're going to learn about ourselves uh, because of that information. I've got another question about Bimini. Okay. Um, I've heard about the Bimini Road, and I've actually seen those boulders, you know, snorkeling in the water. Uh, what do you know about the connection with the Bimini Road and ancient civilization? Well, there's there's still some, uh, let's say, a lot of uh, controversy over whether the Bimini Road, sometimes people call it the Bimini Wall, is a natural formation or whether it's a man-made formation. When you look at it, it does look like cobblestone, either a cobblestone wall or co cobblestone steps. And the thing that really connected the Casey information to that was uh, Casey suggested that Atlantis would rise again in 1968 or 69, and that was exactly when the Bimini Wall was discovered, that somehow this formation off the coast that looked like it might be part of an ancient civilization, maybe the edge of a seaport, was discovered. We've done a lot of uh, tours to the area. Uh, lots. Of, we've even hired submarines to go down and took, take sonar mm -hmm. so, uh, photographs at an angle to see what's down there. But uh, I think it's, it's the remnant of an ancient civilization. Well, what's interesting is when I was snorkeling over this area, I lost all concept of time. It seemed like time did not exist oh, anymore. Oh, wow. Wow. Mm -hmm. um, so it was, I know that that's a cornerstone of the Bermuda Triangle as well. Right, so. right, right. Did he write I, about the Bermuda Triangle? No, he didn't, but he did talk about how the Atlanteans had somehow been able to harness crystals and vibrations in order even to make metal float. So I'm, oh. I'm, my sense is that there's probably some kind of an energy vortex down there that may mm -hmm. be the remnants of whatever still exists wow. underwater. Um, you mentioned um, that uh, he he had a near-death experience himself, and this is what I've read, and this is how he attuned into his own abilities, but that was before he was born as Edgar Casey in the physical, correct? Right, there's, there's, the reading suggests that each and every one of us takes our qualities, our talents, our strengths with us, which is a good thing. The mm -hmm. downside is we also take our biases, our angers, and our <laughs> yes. hatreds with us. Yes. Uh, Casey said that previously he had had a very strong psychic ability, that part of it was developed when he had been in ancient Persia, and he had actually nearly died in a battle on the on the sands, and he had survived. And during when he was still very ill, he had somehow his consciousness had left his body and kind of hovered over his body. And when he was revived, of course, he went back in. And he said because of that experience, his consciousness now could leave his body at will. He could go anywhere, tune into anybody. That's how he was able to give a reading, tune into anybody anywhere because of that experience in Persia. 
That's incredible. Now, you personally have written a lot of books, and uh, one of your goals is to put it in a contemporary language, correct? So people can understand right. that. Um, have you done that with his medical readings as well? Because I know you, on the website, if you join uh, the foundation, which is very minimal fee, it's just to keep things going, um, it, and you can get access to those medical uh, those medical readings, correct? For even uh, illnesses that we have to this day, have you um, been able to put that in uh, contemporary language as well? Sure. Let, let me just back up and say, if you go to edgarcasey.org, edgarcasey.org, mm -hmm. and let's say you have a problem with whether it's psoriasis or allergies or uh, digestive problems or whatever it might be. Uh, there are over 400 illnesses on the database that have already. A, a treatment protocol has been created in contemporary language. So let's say Casey saw 100 people who had arthritis. Mm -hmm. What the treatment protocol does is it takes Casey's approach in regular language and describes what to do about it. So you, you don't even have to be a member. Just go to edgarcasey.org, go to the holistic health pages, and you can see a listing of A to Z in terms of illnesses, acne, whatever. Uh, when you become a member, and you, like you say, it's only $59 a year, but in addition to that, we never turn anyone away. So if you want to be a member and you can't afford $59, we will give you a membership. We give away hundreds of memberships wow. every year. Wow. Uh, you, you have Thank access you. to all, oh, absolutely. You, you have access to all 14,306 readings on your home computer. Uh, and actually, uh, hardly a day goes by that I don't access a reading for something. Wow. So, and e even having been involved for more than 40 years, I still find new and interesting information in those readings. So it's in uh, 24 million words. It's going to take you a while to really absorb it all, but it's an amazing compilation of data. That's amazing. Well, I've got a quick question about the castor oil packs. That Yes, I want to know too. Yes, I do too. Yes, I, I've just read about that. Uh, well, there we go again, <laughs> yes, Beth. Yes, I know it. But um, what is the origin of castor oil and how does it play into all these amazing remedies through them? Well, the, the uh, Latin name of castor oil is actually Palma Christi, which actually means the palm of Christ. So it, it suggests that our ancestors knew there was something about the castor oil bean that could really facilitate healing. And in lots, hundreds of readings, maybe even a thousand, Casey, t probably more than a thousand, Casey recommended a castor oil, castor oil pack, which is basically you get regular cold pressed castor oil and you saturate it in, a, in usually a flannel cloth and you put it over your liver and you lay with it for over an hour or so, and if you want, you can sleep with it. And and for years, p people found that using a castor oil pack would facilitate healing of all kinds, regardless of your problem, it would help. And there was some research done in the 1980s with castor oil, and they discovered what it does is that castor oil helps uh, facilitate and promote uh, the T-cell stimulus. So your T-cells, which are part of your body's own immune system, is what really kicks in and makes it happen. And whether you have you know, I've used castor oil for everything from a sprain to uh, a sore to uh, blemishes, whatever it might be. Castor oil can be very helpful, but it also helps internal problems like stomach problems, problems with your digestion. Uh, Casey suggested castor oil could be very helpful for dissolving tumors. I mean, all kinds of things. That's what I was going to ask you. Um, I don't remember when the word cancer was even created, but was he? did he speak of cancer and um, healing on cancer? Because I know there was no uh, chemotherapy at that time or immunotherapy. Was there any futuristic readings about that and healings on that? Sure, he, he does. He does give lots of readings on cancer, and remember, there's lots of different kinds of cancer. Yeah. But for but almost in every case, when someone had a cancer, regardless of whether it was lung or or breast or whatever it might be, he does recommend the castor oil packs. He mm -hmm. he does also. I just want to set the record straight here. The, the Casey readings draw from every school of medicine. So it's not just totalism, it's also surgery. So very often if somebody had breast cancer, for example, he would recommend having the tumor removed surgically mm -hmm. and then working with the holistic remedies such as castor oil. Because he used the illustration that if you had a, uh, a basket of good apples and there was a rotten apple in there, that rotten apple would help make the other ones rotten as well. Right. So he recommends taking the tumor out and then working with some of the holistic rec remedies as well. And you know, another thing that's significant is while this was happening with Edgar Casey's remedies, I don't believe there was antibiotics were available back then. Mm -mm. Not early on, no, not early on.
And the, the, I mean, you would be amazed. We have lots of testimonials from people who followed the treatment, not only when Edgar Casey was alive, but later, and and got help. I, I have a quick story I can tell you about one of my favorite ones. I was going to ask you that. Please. You read my mind. Sure. You said you're not a reader, but you read my mind. <laughs> so one of one of my favorite examples, and it's in it's in our database, and it happened in 1977. And this is before this is 30 years after Edgar Casey died. It's before computers. It's before email. It's before there were copies of the readings all over the world. Now, of course, you. You can buy them on a DVD ROM, ROM and own them in your own home, or if you're a member, you can access them anywhere. So this is before all that. And this was in this Australia, and this was at a, uh, a woman who was in her 50s, and she was very sick and had been sick for quite some time and didn't know why. She had problems with digestion. She had problems every time she ate. She was always tired. She always felt queasy. Uh, she didn't feel, she felt like she was dizzy. She never had enough energy. And she became so depressed after going to so many different doctors that she told uh, a, a member in her study group, these ecumenical groups that are around the world, that sometimes she just wanted to die. And uh, the second member says, well, why don't you ask for a dream? Ask why you're sick and what you can do about it. So she did. She wrote out, why am I sick and what can I do about it? And in a dream, she had a dream that Edgar Casey came to her and handed her a piece of paper, and it had the number on it, 1880. Well, all the readings here in Virginia Beach are numbered. And right. so she, she wrote a letter to Virginia Beach, and she said, is there a reading number 1880, and if so, can I have it? And there was, and they sent it to her. And when she got it, she was amazed because a man had asked for a reading back in the 1930s, mm -hmm. and everything Casey, all his questions were her symptoms. Very sick, very tired, problems with digestion, had problems eating, problems with gas, problems with liver, everything. And the reading was given for someone with mercury poisoning. Oh, so my she, she, gosh. So, so she and and he and Casey outlined a regimen of treatment. And so the woman's mother lived in the United States. She wrote her mother and said, "Is it possible I would ever have problems with mercury poisoning?" And the woman told her that when she was three years old, she had bitten off the end of a thermometer and swallowed its contents. And so she went to a doctor and told the doctor what her mother had told her. And the doctor said, "I don't think it would still be in your system." But she was tested for mercury poisoning and she had it. She followed the Edgar Casey recommendation given to this guy 40 years earlier, and she was cured it within three months. Now, That's to amazing. me, that has so many amazing things happening. Casey's <laughs> yes. health information, yes. psychic ability, working with your dreams. You know, Absolutely. It's just amazing. Wow. wow. Well, what a have, story. It is. We have to go to commercial break, and we have a call also. So as soon as we get back, you guys, if you want to call in, the number is 678-495-4345. And to the caller that's on hold, we'll get to you in just a moment after our commercial break. Kevin, thank you so much. We're with Kevin Tadashi with the Edgar Casey um, Institute. Be right back. I want to talk about your books and everything. We have a live caller. Let's let's see what the question is. Hi, you're, this is Beth Peters on Psychic Soup. Um, can I have your name and what's your question? Yes. Uh, my name is Lydia, and I'm calling from Washington, D.C., and um, my question had to do with uh, future readings um, that uh, Edgar Casey had for societies, lessons that we can take uh, today. Did you hear that, Kevin? I did. So I'll just give a brief overview. Uh, Casey actually has a, a very positive outlook for our future. He suggests that we are headed for a united world, that somehow we will all become, we will all realize our responsibility toward one another, whether that person is on the other side of the world or right next door. He suggested that eventually, and it may not be in my lifetime, but eventually it would become so uh, pure, he suggested, that it would become known as the age of the lily or the age of purity, that each individual would become much more aware of self-improvement, that self-improvement would become the goal rather than materialism, that we would somehow uh, eventually all have an awareness of our ability to have direct insights and communication with the divine. He suggested that there will be a, a, a renewed sense of spirituality that will come out of China that eventually freedom will come out of communism, that eventually there will be an alliance of world governments where we all start deciding, you know, we need to help take care of one another. Now, right now, all that sounds like science fiction, but let me remind you Not that it sounds, like, it, it sounds like science fiction when you talked about a drop of blood diagnosing any illness, right, absolutely. or science fiction of the Nile flowing westward into the Atlantic. But he sees a very positive outcome of where we're headed as a collective society. That's amazing. And That's I really very encouraging. <laughs> it is. And I appreciate you asking the question. You said your name was Lydia, is that right? 
Yes. Um, That's correct. Good. And, uh, you know, toward the end of the show, we were going to talk about his future predictions of us. So you were very timely in your question. I appreciate <laughs> that. Um, and thanks for calling in. Uh, call in on another show, and I appreciate your question. We'll, um, we'll talk to you again on another show, Lydia. Thank you. Um, very good. Thanks. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Um, Kevin. Uh, sorry, I had to hang up the phone, and I have little baby dinosaur arms, and I can't ever reach it. <laughs> um, we had a question on Facebook about castor oil, but I have a feeling that you actually answered it. So I just want to let the know, the person know that on Facebook, um, thank you for question, your question. I didn't actually get it on a piece of paper, but he went in length about the castor oil. So hopefully you got your answer on that. Um, and you can go to our website and look up castor oil, and even come up on how to do a castor oil pack. Awesome. That's mm -hmm. awesome. Kevin, I have a question for you because we don't have much time, but you've written over 25 books. What would you say is your favorite book and why? That you've well, written. <laughs> that's like your children, that, I'm sure. Yes. That's, that's a hard question. Uh, I would say that, can I name two? Sure. Yes. <laughs> I like that. I noticed on another interview, you love to do things in twos. <laughs> Yeah, two. Yes. I, I would say Edgar Casey on the Akashic Records has to be up there because it, it, it really helps us to understand how we are constantly co-creating our future and that, that you know, we, we, can, we can approach life as victims or we can approach life as co-creators. And it's really, we are co-creators with the divine and it's not something that happens when we pass away. It's actually right now. So our every thought, our every word, our every deed is helping to create our tomorrows. And Casey would often say it's not too late to begin, regardless of how old a person is, that we can transform our lives. So that would so, certainly be one of them. Uh, the other one, and I, and I say this one because th this is, the, the psychic game comes out of this book. It's called The Best Dream Book Ever. And uh, the reason I think that's important is because one of the easiest ways each and every one of us has access to our own intuition is through the dream state. And that the psychic game is actually essentially a waking dream, that somehow getting insights from symbolism because we're wired for guidance, and regardless of what question you have on your mind, I think your own higher self wants to give you an answer, wants to help you. All you have to do is ask. That's beautiful. And, you know, you were talking about how we all have access to this, and that leads me to one of the questions about your personal vibration. Um, you're kind of, in a way, I feel like you're touching on the law of attraction. And right. some people say law of attraction is poo-poo, and some people say, no, it's real. I just think sometimes with verbiage and dialogue, it's misinterpreted. Um, what is your take on that? And I see your personal vibration that we're creating affects us in a way that we can attract our the various people around us, activities toward us, and... Um, I, I wholeheartedly believe in this, and as I teach psychic development, this is one of the things I, I try to teach to people and how you bring that in with your vibration. Can you explain that? Does that relate to the law of attraction, and what is vibration to you? Sure. Uh, vibration is essentially what, what your every thought, your every deed, your activity creates an energetic vortex around you and really sends like out a, a, a call for people. Casey would say that not only do individuals have vibrations, but cities have vibrations. Mm -hmm. Every city has a vibration. And let me tell you quick, qu two quick stories about vibration. Uh, I've had the experience here oftentimes where, let's say someone comes to my office and they'll, they'll have a whole bunch of experiences with people that they seem to be uh, talked down to. Maybe they grew up in a household where their parents are always picking on them. They get married and their spouse is always criticizing them. They have children who talk back. They get it, finally go back to the workplace and their bo boss is always criticizing them. And very often the person will tell me, you know, I guess this is only my karma. Well, this is a great example of vibrations related to like attracts like, because very often this person has a very low self-esteem of this themselves, mm -hmm. and because they have such a negative impression of themselves, they are attracting other people with the very same idea. That's a perfect example of like attracts like, that somehow whatever we put out comes back to us. Absolutely. On the, other, on the other extreme, I think one of the best examples is the example in the Bible where Jesus is walking through a crowd and somebody, a woman theorizes that if she can just touch the hem of his garment, she'll be healed. And it happened mm. because of the vibration in that clothes, in those clothing. Uh, Casey would say that we are constantly carrying around our vibration. Mm -hmm. One woman had a problem when he was alive with, with depression. And she, he helped her with her depression. And when she'd go out, she'd be all dolled up, get all dressed up, go out again. And pretty soon she was depressed again. Casey gave her a reading and told her, her the vibration of depression had infused her pearls. And every time she put on her pearls, she was reinfecting herself because of the, that vibration. Now, you can cleanse something with a higher vibration like music and, and uh, prayer and things like that. But everything down to our clothes has vibration. So vibration is all around us. It's constantly created by what we do, what we think, what we say. 
That's amazing. What a story about the pearls. I know. I love the pearls. And how items like that are passed down generation to generation sometimes. Absolutely. That actually kind of leads to a, a very, we have two very fun questions that we've saved to the end. She's got a question and I have a question. As a paranormal investigator for over 10 years, I have to ask, have you ever sensed or are there claims that Edgar Cayce, uh, his spirit resides at the Institute, and also with the Pearl story, you were talking about how it holds a vibration. Do you think items, um, people like to call them haunted items, but if it's, a, if it's a type of negative vibration, do you think that can really cause like what people would consider paranormal activity in a home? Well, that, that says your second question first. Yes, I think that things can be imbued with a vibration so much so that that residue of that entity, that individual still hangs around, but they're not really there. It's just the vibration of that, that object. Mm -hmm. But I do think there are such a thing as ghosts. And I'm saying that because I've actually seen three. So absolutely there are ghosts and they generally hang around to help people, but they can also hang around because they don't know they're dead. Yes. Uh, in terms of Edgar Casey, uh, I have actually dreamed about Mr. Casey on several occasions. Uh, and I, I felt like it was a uh, personal encouragement, let's say. Uh, I do think he is still uh, very much connected to this work at some level. Uh, I do not think he's going to reincarnate and come back and ask for his life membership back. I think <laughs> right. he's going to have a, have a different work and everything. But I right. do think that the love that he put into this work, the way he was, wanted to be of service, the way he wanted to enable people to help change their lives for the better, that all still continues to this day. And I think he's still very much a part of that. That is beautiful. Okay, before we get to the last question, because I, I don't want to run out of time before we do this, I want to thank you personally, um, professionally, for coming to the show, and I hope that you guys share it. And if you want to hang on the line after the show is over, we just have a couple of things to clean up um, and talk to you personally. But um, for people that want to join uh, the membership, can you tell the website one more time and sure. um, tell why that's kind of important? And then uh, we literally have three minutes because we have a fun question, <laughs> and I'll give you a hint. It's about the wedding, the royal wedding. <laughs> Okay, so, so yes, uh, uh, people can go to edgarcasey.org, E-D-G-A-R-C-A-Y-C-E.org. Mm -hmm. There is uh, more than 3,000 pages there on our website. You can access to virtually anything. You can join for $59 a year and get insights into all kinds of information. We have a magazine, Venture Inward. We have two schools here, accredited schools. One's a master's degree in transpersonal uh, psychology or mindful leadership, and the other is a school of massage. You can take our university programs online. We do conferences online. Online. You, it's just an amazing organization. Uh, you can come here for a spa treatment. We do 300 spa services a week here. So we're a very busy spa. We do two conferences a month here in Virginia Beach. So lots goes on here in Virginia Beach and throughout the country. So exciting. I'm coming for a spa treatment. Yeah. Dawn, ask your question real quick before we go up oh, there. Oh, absolutely. Love is in the air over the weekend with the royal wedding. Um, what significance do you see for uh, the union of an American princess and um, the the UK prince and um, per, was it a, a door that opened yeah. for um, yes, for definitely. love and change and mm -hmm. what are your thoughts on that? Well, uh, these these would not be psychic th thoughts. These would be more looking at the uh, the symbolism of what's going on. I, I think that it, it is definitely symbolic of. Uh, a united world that's somehow uniting the world together. His I think prediction. It is, <laughs> yes. Yeah, I, I think it's. I, I think it's also a great uh, uh, overview of overcoming prejudice and somehow seeing people as all being equal. Mm -hmm. I think it is such a welcome uh, news in the face of so much conflict and anger and animosity going a around in the world. I mean, love trumps hate at all times, Absolutely. but to have that forefront is great but what's really important to me is if you have let's let's imagine there were half a billion people watching that program and being inspired by that wedding those collective thoughts have a real impact upon this earth and that those collective thoughts will do go far to help override what really is fake news will really mm -hmm. override what is anger what will really override people uh, being frustrated with one another. Uh, you know, we, we've got to figure out a way in this country to learn how to love one another, whether we're Democratic or Republican. We just got to do it. And I think that that, that shows us that uh, anything is possible and that energy trumps uh, anger and hate. 
Mm, you know it's what? Beautiful. You are tapping into heart math, and that's a whole nother show. Mm. <laughs> so, absolutely. Um, for those of you that don't know what heart math is, Google it, and I promise you, we're going to have a show on that. But Kevin, I really appreciate you coming on the show today, and I appreciate all the books and the time that you've dedicated to the foundation and carrying on his work. Um, I can tell that this is a personal mission for you, and I just hope that you continue to do it the rest of your living days and enjoy that work that you do. You're very important to a lot of people, so I appreciate that personally. Um, and we're so excited to have you. And you guys, um, you know, if you're looking for Kevin Tedeschi, he's got some stuff on YouTube shows. His books are out there on Amazon, correct? You can get them right. on Amazon um, several places. I'm going to get the one about the Akashic Records, and um, I can't and wait to read I'm going to get it. Contemporary Casey. Yes, yes, <laughs> Contemporary Casey. Get that one, too. And I know that's been translated. But we're signing off. And if you do you have any last as words? I, I just want to thank you both for having me on the program. And, again, come to Virginia Beach. You'll have a great time. Thank you. Thank I you, appreciate Kevin. it. 